this is kind of weird because the court case that I'm involved in isn't something I've ever really talked a lot about apart from like one Instagram post maybe when something big comes out in the news but I actually want to give people a proper update at this point from my point of view you know we went into the court case thinking that we would have total anonymity the whole way through and that I would never talk about it in public and then the UK tabloids got a bit peeved about that and went to court to have my anonymity lifted so I lost it even though I wasn't in favour of that now that I have lost it and my name's out there attached to it um, obviously I want to give my version of events which is often not really talked about in the media the media choose to focus on very specific aspects or a very specific kind of twisting of it that they that makes for good headlines and they miss a lot of the nuance so this is just a kind of rundown of everything that's led to this point and then what's happened this week and then going forward I do feel like it's important to give a quick summary of what the law currently is because it's really it's just hard to understand the rest of the situation without understanding what the law currently says the really short version is that there is currently no legislation explicitly addressing the rights of people who are transgender who become parents. That includes people who become parents before they transition and people who become parents after they transition. The only thing the law acknowledges in the Gender Recognition Act is the, th the fact that some people will already be parents when they transition. And what the law says on that front is simply that transition, or more specifically getting a GRC, so being legally recognised in your acquired gender, that's what the law calls it, so your correct gender, doesn't change your status as the mother or father of a child. Having spoken to people who were involved in the original drafting of the GRA back way back in the late 90s and early 2000s, what that was meant to do was to say that if you had a child before transitioning, you your transition would not affect your status as the mother or father of that child. And some cases have been brought to court to try to challenge that, where someone who was listed as a father pre-transition wanted to change their children's birth certificate to list them as mother or parent after they transitioned. Those cases have all failed. Also, what that law, what that bit of the GRA was meant to do was to ensure that if you transitioned, you couldn't um, abandon your parental responsibility. I think it was written at a time when there was the assumption that a lot of people would be ashamed to transition um, and the focus was very much on trans women. There was no consideration of the possibility that people would become parents post-transition or post having a gender recognition certificate. I think this system is far from perfect it's totally outdated and on some and it's basically just really shitty the idea that you need to be legally certified as who you are in order to have any rights whatsoever just for the purposes of keeping things manageable um, and relevant to my case i'm just going to be talking about people who have a grc who are legally recognized as not just a man or a woman like me a man but who are also recognized under the Gender Recognition Act as male or female because when you have a GRC you don't just change uh, your documents and you don't it's not just about your gender the the law actually says that your sex becomes that of the acquired gender so it's meant to act as a total switch from one to the other legally there's obviously no recognition of non-binary people in this which is another issue the court will only listen to you if you can talk about law until you talk about how the law is meant to protect you and in this case that basically requires you to have a grc the the government have said that um you know regardless of the fact that this wasn't ever taken into account or discussed properly or openly there's no evidence of that discussion taking place anywhere what they will now say is that um under no circumstances can your gender be recognized in respect to parenthood. So what that means in practice is that trans women can only be registered as father and trans men can only be registered as mother or parent two. Parent two is a label exclusively reserved for, uh, as the law is written, it's something like the female partner of a woman that gives birth. So it's basically for lesbian couples. It was a way to get two women on a birth certificate, but 
the second mother, the, the mother who did not give birth, was not allowed the label of mother. Men never get that label of parent unless you talk about adoption certificates and um, surrogacy parental orders, which are different things that I'm not going to go into here because I'm talking specifically about biological parenthood. My identity as a man is recognised legally in every respect except parenthood. So when I become a parent, my recognition, my legal recognition is effectively revoked or cancelled and I'm treated as a woman uh, for the purposes not just of birth certificates but of the um, of like IVF treatment and all the law that surrounds that. I am treated as a mother and the way that the judge justified that was to say that mother is no longer a gender term rather than say um, oh yeah trans people exist and we need to deal with that and, and, and fix the law around that because there's a kind of a gap or a contradiction because the uh, the gender is not recognized in this area he just said oh no we'll just say that mother isn't is not a gendered term anymore even though it is <laughs> once you go behind once you go further into the law um it's not just the word mother it's the word woman and it's it's pronouns she and it's it's all about women what's true to say is that we just weren't taken into account which is understandable um sort of for the times that these laws were created but to try to maintain that argument now um is really shocking, I think. And actually why when we started bringing the case, we thought we would, it wasn't meant to be a kind of revolutionary, radical, controversial thing. What I felt like we were doing was just pointing out a um, an inconsistency. I think the most shocking outcome of the case has been this um, insistence by the government that trans men who do not give birth, but who are straight and married to a cis woman who gives birth, those men also cannot be registered as fathers. Even though lots of trans men in that situation have been registered as fathers, and I've spoken to lots of them, and I'm sure anyone who knows is in the trans community knows people in that situation, and they didn't realise they were doing anything wrong, and the registrars didn't even realise they were doing anything wrong, because those people are men, and there's nothing different about them as men who are legally men with male birth certificates, who are meant to be able to get married to their partners as any other man can, and then do IVF treatment, like many cis straight couples do, sign a form taking on legal parenthood at the point of treatment, and then when the baby is born, go to the registry office and register as mother and father, just like any other couple. As a trans man, there's no mention of having to disclose your trans status. Uh, there's no, there's just no way you'd realise you were doing anything wrong or, or there's no reason to assume that you would be doing anything wrong by going and registering as the father of your child because that's what you would be according to any other reading of the law. I don't want to freak anyone out by saying that. It's a really horrible thing to have to talk about and that the, when the government said that in court it was really shocking. A trans man who has his GRC is married to his wife, they have a kid, that man is not meant to register as father, he's meant to register as parent too. Or he is meant to adopt his child through what's known as a step-parent adoption, <laughs> where, which involves, again, social services, visiting your home and all this sort of stuff. And then on top of that, the mother who gave birth to the child um, in this scenario where you have a cis woman and a trans man married, having a baby together, the mother would also have to adopt her own child. She'd have to give herself permission to adopt her own child so that both parents would be on the adoption certificate for their own child. And then that child would have an adoption certificate even though they weren't adopted. It's just so incoherent. And that was, that was literally the wording we used in court, that there was incoherent and it was inconsistent and there was the mess in the law. And there is a mess overall in the way that all LGBTQ parents are treated by the law. Um, but there is a massive, massive mess when it comes to trans parents. They're kind of saying, well, we're not gonna make you have surgery, but if you do become a parent, then we're not gonna recognize your transition anymore. And you will just revert to being, you know, your sex assigned at birth and gender assigned at birth. It's pretty weird and dystopian. And just basically like, maybe a charitable reading of it is that it's just really lazy by the government to not want to address this messy area that doesn't just affect men who give birth but affects all trans parents. 
the solution could be we could all just have parent one, parent two on all the birth certificates like they do in Canada or Australia or in lots of US states. Rather than taking this really traditional reading of what a birth certificate says, um, you could, and then like adding to it and stitching bits on and twisting bits and reworking and sort of creating this like Frankenstein's monster of law that goes right back to the 1950s and has been like updated <laughs> every time you need to recognize a new version of family. Just like get rid of the old stuff and create a new system that, sit, that fits everyone and it includes everyone and that is gender neutral and that just says parent one, parent two. And you know, I don't know what the ins and outs of that would be. That's not my job. Like that's not the job of the courts even. They just had to rule whether it was unlawful or not. Um, like, but that wouldn't be a radical solution, I don't think. We have this idea that a birth certificate is a, is a record of genetics or biology. Um, it's not, like it never has been. Generally, you have to uh, bring um, a notice of birth from the hospital or something, or the registrar has that anyway. So um, the person that gives birth, who is obviously usually a woman, usually the mother, um, you know, generally that's accurate, but, but any, uh, man can register as the father. There's no way of checking that. You know, it sort of privileges the man in the situation. And there's hundreds and thousands of um, cases where um, someone who is not the biological parent has been registered um, on someone's birth certificate, and that is that can later be rectified or maybe never be rectified because that per the, the person whose birth certificate is may never know. Also, in surrogacy we have this um, very outdated paternalistic system where the surrogate has to go on the birth certificate as a mother. She has no choice. Um, and it's something that surrogates often talk about. They would rather not have to do that. Um, in fact, almost always, um, you could have a system where the parents, the intended parents go down on the birth certificate, but not only does the surrogate go down as the mother, if she's married, her partner goes down as the father. <laughs> Even though he's got nothing to do with it, um, either kind of emotionally, parentally, genetically, certainly, you know, he's just the um, partner of a person who is being a surrogate for, for some parents, like or some, for some future intended parents. And the actual parents have to go to court and have social services visit in order to get what's called a parental order. Um, where they are parent one, parent two, so they're not entitled to the labels of mother and father. Um, it's like, oh God, it makes my head spin. And that's actually where the definition of mother comes from. That's why we, the, the person that gives birth has to be registered as a mother. It comes from a law that's designed to protect surrogates, protect surrogates, again, in this really paternalistic way. So that the idea that um, the person that gives birth has to be the mother doesn't, isn't written really in law anyway. It doesn't come from the original Birth Deaths Registration Act. It's just this sort of, thing that's emerged out of a law designed to protect surrogates. So like, if you can appreciate by this point what I mean by the fact that it's incoherent and a mess, like, oh yeah, I, I, I hope that's coming across. That was meant to be a brief overview of where the law currently stands and to really like hopefully get across this idea that it, this case isn't about a man giving birth, whether he is the mother or the father. This is about how the law in the UK ignores trans parents on every level. Not just ignores us, but now actively discriminates against us by giving us full legal recognition um, and then taking it away at the point at which we become parents. What the GRA was actually designed to do, the whole reason it was created on a, uh, as kind of ordered by a judgment in a European courts of human rights that was called Goodwin, <laughs> was to make it so that trans people did not have to live in an intermediary state. That it was that in-between state of not having a fixed, clear legal gender or sex that the European courts were saying was uh, a breach of human rights. Um, and the government had an obligation to remedy that with what then became the GRA. If I'm being treated by a clinic for IVF treatment, I am, am I legally a man or a woman? Because if I'm a man, then some of the law doesn't apply to me. If I'm a woman, then my um, GRRC is being violated and my legal recognition as a man is being violated. And again, all of this would be, could be remedied not by um, expecting us to switch between these two legal states, but by just acknowledging that we exist and creating language that includes us or making everything gender neutral. The, the HFEA, which is the 
authority that sort of um, regulates fertility clinics already has gender neutral forms for every single thing that they have to have forms for you know so this is something that they recognize trans people they treated me as a man um, even though since our case they have updated their, their guidance because they realized that the government was interpreting the law one way and they were interpreting it a different way like again it's a mess i didn't always know that all this was the case i thought when i first considered pregnancy as the way to start my family i thought i'd be able to register as father and that no one would really ask questions or need to know and it would be sort of a personal matter. I thought it might be similar to in the US where you can go down in many states as mother, father or parent um, depending on your particular circumstances. And thanks to a Facebook group that I was part of I saw a discussion about this um, topic and had this horrible moment of realisation where I realised I was completely wrong and that trans men in the UK or anyone that gives birth um, has to register as mother and there's no other choice. At that point um, I was working for a big newspaper. I went to um, speak to a lawyer there who put me in touch with someone who specializes in fa LGBT family law and put me in touch with someone else. Like <laughs> I was in a very privileged position, which was part of the reason I bought the case. I, I knew that I kind of maybe had the contacts to um, find the right person to represent me and um, also be able to do so pro bono, which the whole thing has been pro bono. And we kind of assessed the situation where the law currently stands and, and they agreed. It just looked like a sort of, um, inconsistency or that there was a gap in the law. It wasn't that anyone was actively discriminating or actively doing anything wrong. It was just that people didn't realize that trans people were becoming parents after having a GRC. And we would just sort of take this to the government and say, um, hey, maybe you want to clarify this or fix this. We all felt really positive about it. Like this was 2016 and the whole transphobic moral panic in the UK was much, much calmer and cooler and more fringe and, and hadn't like totally taken over the public discourse about trans people in the media and in politics and this was there was a conservative government so it wasn't like it was a left-right thing it was just that the conservative government was trying to reform the gender recognition act you know all things all seemed quite positive and going in the right direction i bought the case and we took it to the high court and i have representation and my son has his own legal representation because you have to represent the rights of the child separately that's something that's often missed in the media coverage of this the media want to portray it as if it's all about me and my rights um, and it's really 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 not if anything it's more about my child's rights so that's why he has his own lawyers and legal team and if at any point they feel independently of me that his rights are going in a different direction to mine or his interests lie elsewhere from mine they will put that first always um, and there's nothing I can do about that and that's the way it should be even though that's kind of a scary idea obviously we've worked closely together but they are that is an independent team and he has a representative who um, sort of uh, assesses his interests like a, a kind of court appointed guardian type person. But yes, both of those teams, mine and my sons, uh, went to court feeling quite confident um, and then were really disappointed when at the High Court, the president of the family division sort of just didn't seem to ever really fully understand what we were trying to say. And that was the point at which I Felt, began, began to feel very disillusioned with the whole justice system and the whole process where I sort of thought, well, at the very least, they will engage fully with what we're saying and they may ultimately disagree on a point of law, but at least we'll have had a kind of fair hearing on an even playing field. There was disregard for very many of the sort of points that we raised and, and a failure to sort of um, fully consider them. There was quite, it was, you know, often talked about and quite queer phobic terms about you know as if I was trying to hide something from my child talking about the child has the right to know um, who gave birth to him as if I was ever saying that he shouldn't you know like the two thing that, that, that there was just this inability to understand it from the point of view of someone who does give birth who isn't a woman and who is queer and trans but isn't ashamed of it and isn't trying to hide it like Basically, the court was just full of old cis white men, <laughs> apart from the people on my team, and they just really didn't get it. And so when the government, uh, I think, lied about the fact that the GR, the original Gender Recognition Act, took into account this um, scenario, but and, and, and the idea was that a trans person would revert to their gender assigned at birth if ever they became a parent, and that was deliberate and that was intended, and they stood up in court and said that, I was just floored. Like I couldn't believe my ears. I thought I didn't. I didn't ever 
imagine that happening. Like, rather than admit that there was an inconsistency and try to solve it, they would just lie and say, oh no, yeah, this is what this is what's meant to happen. This is perfectly fine. <laughs> yeah, at that point, I just realized that it wasn't, like, we didn't have the same access to justice that, we, that the government did, basically. It wasn't justice, it was a game that we were playing. And it was a power play and, the idea that any old any individual citizen can go to court and get a fair hearing just isn't true, especially if you're a member of a minority that's like widely misunderstood. I always had this feeling that if I could just sit down with the judge and have a beer or a cup of tea, um, it would have been so different because he would have he would have had empathy. And judges aren't supposed to need empathy; they're supposed to make legal decisions. But actually, in this case, where you have a human situation that's really complicated and hard to understand, if you're not coming from my perspective. And in the family court especially, where cases are really emotional, the judge often is, is an empathetic person. There was this bizarre judgement about mother no longer being a gendered term and it all being about child deserves to know where he comes from. And, like, no one would argue with that. Like, we weren't arguing against that. All of the points we did make were ignored in the judgement, not even mentioned. And then the appeal court was even worse. Uh, so after, in the UK, after the High Court, you have the appeal court where it's, it goes from one judge to three judges. Again, um, the judges looked very confused at certain points and just sort of with literally with a confused look on their face um, and seemed quite, um, yeah, just disinterested, never really properly engaged. It was like they'd made their decision from the outset um, and, the, and the appeal judge really focused again on this idea of the child has the right to know who gave birth to him, which again, no one was arguing against and just failed to engage with any of our arguments. So we had like lots of points to take forward to the Supreme Court, which is the third and final level of court in the UK, they didn't even give us a chance. <laughs> they just said no. Despite the multiple points that we raised, they just said no. And there was a, they took a long time to reach that decision, um, which isn't to say I think they've spent a long time thinking about it. I think it was just because of COVID and everything, things were delayed. I know this sounds over, oversimplified, but they just don't get it. Like, they don't understand they don't see trans people as full people that they, they they may not understand the whole intent of the gra they, they just have no knowledge of our history and the context in which we exist and our rights genuinely just aren't that important to them because <laughs> if you are able to look at it objectively which i don't suppose i am but you know my lawyers are you can just see quite a kind of simple sorry i thought that was my pocket you can see a kind of simple inconsistency and incoherence in the law I guess it's easier for the judges to say, well, this is working for cis straight people. There aren't other queer people making a fuss about it, at least that we pay attention to. So let's just leave it as is. I made this promise to my kid before they were even born, before I was even pregnant, that I would try every legal route to try and remedy this situation, which is so unfair and will affect him going forward in his life and other children uh, who are born, who are lucky enough to be born to trans parents um, of all kinds in this country. It affects them, it's their documents. Their documents are wrong and inaccurate and confusing and could lead them uh, into danger. Um, they would require them to go into detail about their parents' medical history, if ever they had to produce their full birth certificate at a job, you know, if you have a job in government, any kind of high level job that requires clearance, um, or any kind of identification certification process, you have to provide your full birth certificate. Um, maybe a, what you call it, like criminal records check for working with children. Um, you would have to explain why your father is listed as your mother. Um, that, another point of the GR, Gender Recognition Act, GRA, was to prevent that from needing to be disclosed in all but the most sort of specific and high level circumstances. There are some countries, many countries in the world where my child might not want to go to and might be put in danger going to if he has to produce his birth certificate. And again, <laughs> it sort of outs him as having a queer family um, rather than being something that he can choose to disclose as and when is safe and appropriate. And it also just like, just his sense of self and our, our, all of our children's sense of selves um, it's it's not fair of the government to say that this is a, um, a legitimate and coherent solution to this situation where they give us legal recognition up to a certain point and then take it away when it comes to our children.
That is why, even though we're not going to the Supreme Court in the UK, we can go to Europe, but we basically have to exhaust our domestic um, um, paths to justice or our solutions before we're allowed to go to Europe. Now that the Supreme Court have said no, we can just go straight to Europe. So before we might have lost at the Supreme Court and gone to Europe anyway, but we are going to go to Europe. Um, it takes a long time, probably several years. I have the most wonderful lawyers um, and we're going to continue to work together. So I think we should know whether we are going to be allowed to take the case to Europe. They have to like um, approve the, our application first. I think we should know that within the next six months to a year. You don't actually go in person, you just basically then wait for a judgment for many, many years. There are other cases in Europe currently at the European Court of Human Rights also dealing with this issue. Um, there's one from Russia, there's one from Germany, there is one from France coming, there's one from, I think, Sweden as well. Um, and what may be the case is that the court will take all of these similar cases and just decide to hear one of them and then like apply that decision to the rest of them. So we're definitely not alone in fighting this battle. I am going to be raising money for this. Um, my lawyers will work pro bono, but there is, it is hours and hours and days and days of work <laughs> for free that um, I don't think I don't think that's fair and also there'll probably be other costs that come up down the road as you know there's lots of paperwork involved and admin and all those sorts of things so it's not live yet it doesn't exist we haven't figured out what it's going to be yet but there will at some point be a, a fundraiser um, to help make this happen so I'll definitely obviously keep you up to date with that because any help that we can get will be amazing um, to fix this situation not just for me certainly well certainly not just for me but not not just for my child but for hundreds of families around the uk that are in this situation if this could lead to a solution not just for trans families but actually for lgbtq families where we are all equal under the system of births registration and that there isn't a birth certificate with mother and father just for cis straight couples and then other sort of mishmashed solutions all cobbled together from various ancient bits of law for other people um that would be great <laughs> but yeah like don't worry about me often people will message me and say you know you must be devastated you must be this i'm not like i knew this was going to be a long fight i understand where these transphobic bullshit decisions come from this is the world we live in we just have to keep fighting and being strategic about it and um all, all these fights often are proceed you know they often go a really long time like the gra which again isn't perfect but um it's the best thing we have right now um it was brought into law in 2004 the cases that led to it there was a whole series of cases that, that slowly slowly pushed the government further and further towards giving trans people legal recognition those cases were being brought in the 80s all the way through the 80s 90s to the 2000s so my case might be the first and it might fail, but it certainly will not be the last. If you have a situation that you think is relevant in this context and you want to see if there's a possibility that you know you could bring a case or you could contribute to someone else's case, then please do get in touch. Um, probably the best place to do that is my email, which I'll leave below. I wouldn't be able to make a decision on that. That would be for the lawyers, but um, yeah, I guess the first time, this is the first time I've spoken about all this publicly for like four years, so it was gonna be a long one. It's really important to me, obviously, so thank you for listening. Next time I will talk about, I don't know, nappies or something, or Christmas, <laughs> something a bit lighter. All right, take care, bye-bye.